My name is Amy Kuzieski, and I'm a professor of mathematics and radiology and neuroscience at Weill Cornell Medicine, as well as a professor in the computational biology and department of statistics and data science at Cornell University. And I'm pleased today to be telling you about functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is the data that we'll be using for the WIDS and Kaggle University Challenge. So I'm really excited to tell you about how fMRI works today. So we've been really interested in a long time in how the human brain works and how it um, completes all of these really complicated tasks of daily living. And our, I like, always like to point out that there was a, actually a sort of functional brain imaging experiment that was done a long, long time ago in 1882. There's an Italian physiologist named Angelo Masso. And in this uh, experiment, the subject, uh, live human subject was set on a delicately balanced table. And this table had um, a very uh, uh, sensitive mechanism that when any of the weight increased in either the foot or the head, it would tip in that direction. And so he had this person um, perfectly balanced on the table. And then he asked them to think about some kind of very difficult math problem. And as they thought about that math problem, neurons fired, they demanded more metabolic uh, sources from the from the blood and the blood was rerouted to the brain and then the table would tip in the direction of the head and so this is kind of the first um, evidence that we had that uh, something was happening in our brains that was special when we actually were doing something that was cognitively demanding um, now come along mri only 90 years later uh, so mri was invented in about 1977 and it was really good at imaging soft tissues. So things like x-ray had been used to look at bones and, and hard structures in the body. Um, but in 1977, when the MRI was invented, it enabled um, patients and researchers or cl uh, clinicians and researchers to image soft tissues, uh, which and that includes the brain. So an MRI is basically a very strong magnet. Um, so usually MRIs are a three Tesla, which is about 60, thousand times the Earth's magnetic field. And this magnet is always on and it aligns all of the protons and the water molecules in your body in a specific direction. So when you're put into an MRI scanner and you kind of get on this table and you're wheeled inside the MRI scanner, there's a, a um, uh, inherent magnetic field that aligns all of those protons in the water in your body in a specific direction. Then what they do to take pictures of you, the soft tissues of your body is they transmit radio waves into the sub, into the person who's sitting um, in the scanner. And then they turn off the transmitter and they receive the radio waves returning from the subject from those protons that were perturbed by the radio waves. And then what they do is convert this RF data into an image. And then we end up with something that looks like this. So here you can see this is a sort of her person's head. Here's their nose, their eyes, their mouth. Um, and you can see this is kind of a sagittal view of the brain um, and the different parts of the brain, the ventricles and the gray matter uh, and different white matter structures. And there's the cerebellum. So you can see this gives you a really clear picture of the different structures and tissue contrasts in the body. Structural brain MRI has many clinical uses that are uh, used um, this, uh, uh, in, in the current um, clinical uh, practice. And you can see here um, is an example of a person who's had a stroke in the specific part of their brain. And you can see that there's a, a very um, sort of high contrast of the area of, of damage or injury in stroke subjects. Um, it's also used to image white matter lesions in multiple sclerosis, for example. So here you can see all of these sort of hyper intense white matter uh, uh, lesions in a person who has multiple sclerosis. And then of course, using it to image where tumors are in the brain to do uh, sort of pre-surgical planning. So that's brain structure, but what about brain function? So the first functional MRI was done in 1992. So there was this brilliant uh, researcher, Seiji Ogawa, and he observed that there was this oxygenation level dependent signal in T2 star in 1990. And he, what this uh, sort of blood oxygenation level dependent or bold signal is, is essentially an increase in the oxygenated blood in a specific part of the brain. Now, what happens is when you um, complete a cognitively demanding task or you look at some kind of visual stimuli, there is an upregulation upregula up of neural activity in the particular part of the brain that is um, receiving that stimuli or underlying um, the cognitive demand. And as your neural activity increases, then of course your neurons are going to demand more oxygen and more metabolic uh, input. And so then what happens is um, the vasculature responds to that and it 
reroutes blood flow to the neurons that are firing. And as that oxygenated blood increases for this uh, to overcompensate for the oxygen consumption in the neurons that are firing, then the oxygen level in the venous blood is actually elevated and that results, results in a larger MRI signal. So uh, Ogawa did this experiment where he flickered a checkerboard. So it was on, off for 60 seconds and on for 60 and off for 60. So he was doing this flickering checkerboard. And if you looked at the brain activity, activity in the visual cortex, so here it's in the back of the brain, um, you can see, and uh, here's a time course of the brain active of the uh, bold signal um, over time. You can see in the on state where you had the flickering checkerboard on and the visual stimuli was was input, you see a much higher level of bold activity uh, or bold signal, uh, which indicates higher levels of neural activity in the on state than they had when the checkerboard was turned off. So here's a section of off, on, off, on. You can see how the bold activity, uh, the bold signal or the brain activity is lower in the off state and higher in the on state. So this was sort of the first um, functional MRI imaging that was performed um, to see how the brain activity changed when stimuli was altered um, over time. So in contrast to structural MRI, which allows us to look at the sort of anatomical changes or anatomical structures of the brain, um, we have functional MRI, which allows us to look at how different parts of the brain activate in response to different stimuli or under different task conditions. And so then what that gives us is structural MRI is a static image. There's just a single picture of the brain. Um, and then in functional MRI, over time, we have different uh, uh, pictures of the brain over time. So here we have a, a fourth dimension um, rather than X, Y, and Z in space. We also have a, a fourth dimension in time. And you can also see by comparing these sort of examples of structural and functional MRI that functional MRI has much lower spatial resolution and, uh, and much uh, worse sort of signal to noise properties. And that's because we do have to acquire them quickly in order to capture brain activity over time. And so that is one of the trade-offs of functional MRI when compared to structural MRI. Now, functional MRI has been used really extensively in the past um, 20 or so years to look at how brain activates during different tasks. Um, and so sometimes people will be put in the scanner and they'll be shown different images or there, there'll be different auditory tones played. And the fMRI is used to basically look at how the brain responds and essentially what they do is they provide the stimulus, they record the neural activity via the bold uh, sort of hemodynamic response, and then they get some sort of areas that are higher during the stimuli than not. So essentially they just subtract the stimulation activity from the control activity, and they get the difference images which tell you where in the brain uh, the, the neurons are activating in response to the specific task or stimuli. Um, and so there's lots of different tasks that you can do in the scanner during functional MRI to understand the neural basis of uh, stimuli of um, processing and behavior, including visual and auditory stimuli, cognitive or motor tasks. So you can do like finger tapping in the scanner or um, sort of gambling uh, cognitive tasks. And then there's also things like um, naturalistic stimuli like movie watching that looks at how the brain activates uh, when it's watching a, a, a movie. Now there's also, uh, in, in sort of contrast to the task fMRI, when a person is specifically doing a task in the scanner, there's also something called resting state fMRI. So this was um, sort of found by Bharat Biswal in 1995. And what he found was that looking at regions that activate together at rest, um, they also activated together during a corresponding task. So what he was actually doing was an ex a finger tapping experiment in the fMRI scanner. So he had the person kind of moving their finger. He identified the areas that activated when they moved the finger, which of course were in the motor cortex um, by using that sort of uh, subtraction procedure. Um, and, and then what he did was he just wanted to see if there were other regions in the brain that sort of correlated uh, with the activation of the regions that controlled the finger. So what he did was he drew this sort of circle around the area that activated during the finger tapping task, and he correlated all the other voxels uh, activities in time with those uh, voxels activities um, uh, in the finger area. And he found that there was a, a very strongly correlated region in the other hemisphere. So it, even though the person was tapping their right finger and getting activity in their left motor cortex, um, e when you look at resting, you see this, there was this high temporal uh, correspondence between the left and right finger areas. 
And so this was a this was a sort of key insight into resting state fMRI or putting someone in a scanner and not having them do anything specific, but looking at the correlation structure of the activation over time to see these networks that underlie some specific behavior, in this case, motor or finger tapping. And so then in 2001, there's this really seminal paper uh, from Mar Marcus Reichel's group where he sort of found these canonical uh, resting state networks um, that sort of divided the brain into functional territories. So uh, some of these functional territories are, are things like, uh, you know, the visual network that responds to visual input or sensory motor network that re responds to sensory or motor information. And then there's more higher order things like um, executive attention networks and default mode networks or, or self-referential thought. And so when a person is in the scanner, oftentimes if you ask them what they're doing, um, they will say that they're thinking about maybe what they had for breakfast or something that happened last week, um, or they're thinking about what they're going to do in the future and perhaps also attending to their environment, the sounds of the scanner and what they're looking at visually. And so um, by looking at this sort of brain at rest, we can divide the brain into these networks um, that are specific to and underlie specific functions. So here's an example of a, of a um, sort of most recent division of the brain into these sort of specific networks of function. And you can see that there are different sort of resolutions of parcellation that you can do. So this one on the left has seven networks and they include things like visual, somatomotor, attention networks, and things like uh, uh, default mode networks or frontal parietal networks. Um, and then you can divide them even further into things that are a little bit more um, specific. Uh, so, you know, two, two different visual systems, different somatomotor systems. So these are essentially um, a way of mapping using this resting state fMRI, um, mapping what parts of the brain are underlying specific um, functions or uh, uh, behaviors. So um, I think some of the other tutorials might talk about this a little bit, but I wanted to touch on it for this tutorial as well. Um, and when we have this resting state fMRI, we have a basically a time series for every little voxel in the brain. And these voxels can be, let's say, two millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters. So you have this little tiny section of tissue. And for each of these tiny sections of tissue, you have a time series of activity. And again, with our bold signal, we know that higher levels of bold correspond to um, more neural activity in that specific uh, region. And so here we just have an example of five different regions in the brain. They're delineated by these five different colors. And then over time, we can plot their time, those regions time series. So here we have those five regions time series where we have the bold signal, which is a proxy for neural activation over time. And then what we can do is correlate those two, uh, any two regions time series together, just using, let's say, Pearson correlation. And then we get a strength of functional connection or um, uh, co-activation. Um, and so here, what we can see is that we can construct what we call a functional connectivity matrix um, by correlating each of these pairs of act, uh, time series of activation. So for example, um, A11 is the correlation of uh, the first region's time series with itself, which is always one. So here, for, for example, A AII or entries in the matrix that represent a region's correlation with itself is always one. And then as we move along, we can see that we can also correlate, let's say, region one and two and put that in the uh, second entry of the first row. And as you and we construct it just like that, uh, and so we have all the correlations between region one and all the rest of the regions in that first row. And then um, as we go we uh, down the the columns, we can see that we just um, kind of invert the regions order. But in Pearson correlation, the order of the time series doesn't matter. So we also see that this functional connectivity matrix is symmetric. So a one two is equal to a two one or more generally, AIJ is equal to AJI. So the functional connectivity between region I and region J is the same as the functional connectivity between region J and region I. Um, and so that's how we construct a functional connectivity matrix. Um, and this is an example of an actual functional connectivity matrix. So you can see that different sort of um, sections of the brain, which are delineated by these lines, um, have very different patterns of connectivity with the other sections of the brain. Um, and then there are also these sort of highly connected uh, parts of the brain that usually correspond to those resting state networks that I mentioned briefly earlier. So once we have these functional connectivity matrices, we can actually use them to 
predict or um, to classify various groups or to predict behavior of various groups. So there's been a, um, thousands of papers that have looked at mapping functional connectivity measurements from individuals to things like cognitive and emotional processing, mathematical ability. Of course, age has an effect on functional connectivity matrices, uh, strengths, intellectual performance, perceptual performance, hormone fluctuations even have an effect on functional connectivity. Um, and we also, of course, are interested in looking at how psychiatric illnesses may result in differences between um, controls and the diagnostic group um, and things like neurological disease, how they are uh, changing functional connections as well. And understanding those uh, sort of mappings between functional connectivity and some kind of behavioral or disease marker um, can tell us about the neural substrates that underlie the various things that may be then um, important for uh, developing treatments or, or strategies for, for uh, therapy. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on all of these steps, but there are a lot of choices that go into fMRI experiments. So sort of the first choice is the, the field that you're going to apply. Um, so the magnets field could be either 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla, or 7 Tesla, depending on your magnet strength. Um, and that has a big impact on the sort of signal to noise ratios of the time series that you eventually get. And then of course, doing the experimental design, if you're doing some kind of stimulus, uh, how long do you do the stimulus for? How do you um, sort of present the stimulus in time? Um, and then also things uh, like artifacts and data acquisition te techniques. So how do we actually set up the, the parameters of the MRI scan? And then things like quality control and pre-processing have a big impact as well on our final metrics. Um, and these include things like motion correction. So when a person is in a scanner, they might move a little bit more than the other person in the that another person in the scanner, and that has an impact on our eventual measurements from fMRI. Um, so how we analyze that data can impact our, our final metrics. And then of course, looking at analysis method, methods, either task-based or, or resting state, how we're actually gonna quantify the co-activation. So here I just talked about uh, Pearson correlation, but can use other approaches to correlate time series and look at their co-activation. And then of course, which is more important for, for the challenge here, the statistical analyses and, and sort of approaches that we use to map those final functional connectivity metrics to behavior and then how we report and interpret the results. So um, all of these uh, sort of upstream choices have an impact on our downstream metrics, um, but we're not gonna be really focusing on too much that on, on that too much. What we will be focusing on instead in this challenge is looking at how you might use the measures of functional connectivity to map to things like age or um, other behavioral metrics. So in summary, um, MRI is a non-invasive way to image the living brain and um, looking at the structure as well as the function. Functional MRI tracks oxygenated blood, which is a proxy for neural activity and allows us to look at uh, brain activity over time. Um, and, it, and it can either be during a task, say movie watching or a cognitive task, or during sort of quote unquote rest, which is just the person sitting in the scanner and they're told not to think about anything in particular. And resting fMRI can actually be used to create functional connectivity networks or matrices that represent the strength of the connections between the brain. And when I say connections here, I just mean the, the similarity of time series uh, of activation. And these functional connectivities are often mapped to behavior or demographics or disease and other tutorials will talk more about brain behavior mapping. Um, fMRI is complicated and there are many choices in an experimental design that can influence brain behavior mapping. But what we're gonna do is, is focus on using those functional connectivities to map to some kind of demographics in this challenge. So with that, I will stop and thank you for your time.